Hey, good morning, everyone. It's Pastor Jim Harkless from the Canyon Community Church in Lake California. It's December the 26th, 2021. As we continue looking at the Christmas story, look at the story of the Magi, part two. Glad you're with us. We'll have a song and then we'll join our message in progress. As a uh, programming note, we'll be next week we'll be in the Gospel of Luke, and then in two weeks that will be in Revelation chapter 20. Pretty excited, talking about the coming kingdom. We're there, we've been looking forward to that. We wonder what the future will be like, a time of righteousness on the earth, and He will reign, and we're going to see that in two weeks when we come back to our study in Revelation. But this morning we're going to be once again in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 2, looking at part 2 of the story of the Magi. You know, I never cease to stand amazed in awe of the Word of God. And every time when we look at the Christmas story, I find there's always more to be discovered and known. The last time we saw in, our, in part one of our series on the Magi, Magi, and it's pronounced Magi, I have a bad habit of pronouncing Magi, but it's actually Magi, who came seeking he was born king of the Jews. And we found out last time that they were a group of men from a high order of religious priests from Persia, very powerful very influential. We discovered last time they're not necessarily three. We have customs that we look at three kings of Orient Art, but they were, there was more than one, but possibly more than three. We don't know. Just more than, we do more than one. We also discovered they did not necessarily just come by camel. They could have possibly come by horseback. They probably didn't come alone as they were king makers. They were very influential men power brokers behind the thrones of the Middle East at the time who selected and appointed kings. They were very influential. And so when they traveled, like most dignitaries do, they probably had a, a personal protection force, security force. Could have been from 10 to 100, 200 people. 
We don't know. We don't know. The Bible doesn't say, so we're left to speculate on that. But the most likely, they did not just three old coots wandering through on camels, as they, and then they didn't show up the night of, as we'll see that. This morning, we're looking again to chapter 2 of Matthew again. And uh, as a sermon outline, we're using an acrostic uh, beginning with the letter A. That's going to be arrival, agitation, action, adoration, and avoidance. I'm reading Matthew chapter 2, beginning verse 1 through verse 18. And the scripture tells us, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Magi came from the east, arriving in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who had been born king of the Jews? For he saw his star in the east, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And he said to them, Well, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what had been written by the prophet. And thou, Bethlehem, land of Judah, by no means least among the leaders of Judah, out of you shall come forth a ruler, who will shepherd my people Israel. And then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and carefully search for the child, and when you have found him, report to me that I may too may come to worship him. And after hearing the king, they went away, and the star which they had seen in the east went on before them till it came and stood over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And then coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary's mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. And then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been, been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Now when they had gone, verse 13, Now when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt, and remain here till I tell you, for Herod is certainly going to search for the child to destroy him. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still dark and left for Egypt. And they remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod heard he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi that what had been, been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children. And she refused to be comforted because they were no more. May God bless this word. Going again, going to our outline of the arrival. We, we read last time and this morning about the Magi's arrival. They arrived in where? They arrived in Jerusalem, the capital city of Judea, because where else would you look for a king other than the nation's capital? And these kingmakers arrived very likely with a protection force, a long, dangerous journey, thousands of miles coming from Persia, either modern-day Iraq or even far as Iran, and filled in a country filled with bandits and robbers. And they had an armed security force with them, no doubt, as we speculation, but we no doubt they were not alone. As we see, shall see, as far as when they arrived, an obvious time gap exists from the night Jesus was born until the, the Magi arrived. Three observations, one in Matthew 2.11, said, After coming to the house, they saw the child with Mary's mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. That word house is oikia, which is words we get the word a residence or abode, a home or a house. And it contrasts with being, Jesus being in the manger in the Luke's account. When Jesus was born, uh, he was laid in the manger, which was a feeding trough for fodder for livestock. And so you, I remember being around horses, the walk into the stall and has a little manger up there where you dump the grain and the hay and then the horse would eat it. And Luke 2, 11 says, For today in the city of David have been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. He will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. A second reason why it wasn't the first night is that the same night that Jesus was born is the night they were, they were to flee. Verse 14 says, So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still dark and left for Egypt after the Magi showed up and, and did their thing. Verses presenting to Jesus in the temple on the seventh day in Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. 
Luke 2, 21 says, And when eight days had passed before his circumcision, his name was then called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in a womb. So it couldn't have been the same night that Jesus was born, as our Christmas traditions go. And a third point, and why it wasn't the same night, was Herod's decree to kill all the male children two years and younger. A time gap of six weeks up to two years took place. The so point is, they didn't visit the same night that Jesus was born. The second of, uh, point of our sermon on acrostic is uh, agitation. We talked about this last time when Herod heard this, he was troubled. And all of Jerusalem with him. And there are three reasons why he was for this agitation, not only of, for, of Herod and of the whole city, but the political reason was, is that there was a, the Jerusalem and Israel is on the eastern edge of the Roman Empire, and there's still a battle, border battles going between the, the Parthenians and the uh, Persians to the east and the Romans. And so it, Jerusalem has changed control several times over the course of history. It was the 37 years earlier, Herod had to flee Jerusalem. He went to Petra and had to flee for his very life. And he went back to Rome with a good amount of money. He bought, bought out Caesar Antony and got appointed king of Israel. And he was given an army to come back to take back control of the land. And he did after three long years of warfare. And so he was afraid of another plot to, to remove him from power. And now here are these kingmakers show up in town, these magi saying, where is he who's been born king of the Jews? So it was a political aspect to his agitation. It was also a religious aspect. These magi were seeking for one who was born king of the Jews. It was a threat to Herod's throne because Herod did not have a legal claim to a throne. He was not even a Jew. He was not even Jewish. But then also there is personal reasons for his agitation. That is great jealousy. You see, Herod was appointed by a, a king by Caesar, and you know, claimed to the throne, but he was a very je jealous person and protective of his, like most dictators are, of his power and of his uh, influence. And uh, let me just say that Herod would not be um, nominated as father of the year, nor husband of the year. He has a long history of murdering people. You see, it was in 35 B.C. that he had a young high priest named Aristopolis put to death. And then he, he had his own uncle put to death in 35 B.C. He had his favorite wife. He had ten wives. His favorite wife he had put to death. And Alexander in 29 B.C. He then had a brother-in-law, Costabar, put to death in 28 B.C. Then his two own sons he had put to death in 7 B.C., Alexander and Aristobulus again. And then another son he had put to death, three sons he killed in 4 B.C. Not nominee for father of the year, to say the least. Very jealous man. I mean, you're talking taking a life. Eight lives were taken to protect his throne. He was very agitated with these magi rolled in the town saying, where is he who was born king of the Jews? So what's he do? He takes action. The third point of our sermon, the rival of the magi sent Herod into action. He consulted the religious leaders. We saw that in verses 4 to 6 of Matthew 2. And they quote from Micah, was written 700 years prior, speaking of Bethlehem. He said, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you come forth a ruler who would shepherd my people Israel. And a number of things, we see a number of things taking place here. Four observations about this coming king. One, he's going to be ruler in Israel. Two, his goings forth are from the days of eternity. In other words, this is not just a man. This is God. Jesus existed far beyond when he was born. He existed in eternity past. And he will rise and shepherd and care for his people. Herod didn't care for the people, obviously. He must have put them to death. And he will be great to the ends of the earth. We're talking about world dominion at his coming kingdom. And we, we're learning about it in the book of the Revelation. It's fascinating that these scholars, Bible scholars, these scribes and, and experts knew where the king was to be born. But it's amazing that they never even walked the five miles from Jerusalem down to Bethlehem to the south to check it out for themselves. Isn't that amazing? More on that in just a little bit. In verses 7 and 8 of Matthew 2, 
Herod secretly called the Magi, in other words, behind the door negotiations, some messengers are in a truth flag. Hey, come, let's, let's get together, let's talk, so they had a little powwow in the back room. But Herod was setting up an evil plan to murder and assassinate the baby Jesus. We see this, and of course, the pattern of his own life of killing his own family members. He said, well, I want to come and worship him too. And so he met with them, they went on their way, they came and worshiped him, and then he's going to go back and and try, when he found out that they double-crossed him, the Magi is, he's going to see in verse 16 and 17 and 18, he saw that he'd been tricked by the Magi, became very enraged, and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity from two years old and younger, according to the time he had determined from the Magi. From then was written, spoken through Jeremiah the prophet, was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refused to be comforted for they were no more. Ramah is in the modern day city of Eram. It's a five, six miles north of Jerusalem. Bethlehem is to the south. So basically a, a 10 to 12 mile diameter around a, a, map, a circle around the map around Jerusalem. And all the two male children, two years and under, were, were executed by, it, under, by Herod's orders. Tragic. Verse 9 of, uh, tells us, though, that uh, after hearing the king, the Magi went their way and saw the star they had seen in the east. And they saw the star, and it, it went before them and stood over the place where the, where the child was. We talked about that last time. It was not just, uh, it was the Shekinah glory of God. It wasn't just an errant comet. Because stars go from east to west. It was going north to south. Again, Bethlehem was to the south of Jerusalem. And it was low enough they could follow it. And it was amazing how, how they did that. And, and so... God's, God's able to d demonstrate His glory. Remember, He led the people in the wilderness for 40 years with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, a fire world by night and a tornado by day. God's able to always manifest His glory, and He also always does it with light. Adoration. Point four. After coming to the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped Him. Then opening their treasures, they presented Him gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. They worshiped and these Gentiles. These are Gentiles who were not Jewish people. But they had heard. They had heard from the prophecies of Balaam. Back in Numbers chapter 22 to 24, they'd heard from Daniel's influence and Daniel was among them, a Jewish captive under Babylonian rule in the 600 BC. And they came and they worshiped. And they gave. Worship involves giving involves giving of our heart and our life and requires an act of giving of oneself to worship and involves time. They came a long way to worship. It makes, make, means making ourselves available to worship God. It involves thoughts and words and actions. The gifts, the gold points to Jesus' deity, His royalty. The frankincense is an incense which gives off a, a pleasing fragrance, reminds us of the Father's word in the Jesus' baptism. He said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And then the third thing they gave was myrrh, a very expensive ointment used for embalming and preparing a person for burial, which speaks of Christ's pending death. It's worth noting that in Isaiah 60, at Christ's second coming, Gold and frankincense to be uh, presented to him, but no myrrh. Isaiah 66 says, Herds of camels will cover your land, young camels of Midian and Ephrath, and all from Sheba will come bearing gold and incense and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. So gold and fr frankincense will be offered in the future, but now myrrh. But myrrh is mentioned here because it's presenting with his first coming when Jesus came to die for our sins on the cross. It's interesting that though they didn't realize it, these very expensive gifts would be God's financial provision as a family as they would come in flight and extend his stay in Egypt. You know, God always provides for our needs, often in unexpected ways. And it reminds of our Lord's words in Matthew chapter 6, especially these uncertain inflationary times in which you live. I was thinking about it this morning. For especially for, for those younger folks, 30, 40, years. They were, did, they were not around in 1980s when 70s and 80s when we had the high inflationary periods we had. Some of you remember it was difficult and money didn't buy much. And for some young people who are struggling with this is my money can't go. Is a, gas is outrageous. 
Everything's outrageous. And, and your money doesn't go as far as it used to. And you're really struggling, especially if you're living on the edge and you don't apply biblical principles of finances to your life. Then they're really on the edge. But I want to share a word of encouragement from Matthew chapter 6, as I thought about that this morning. Let's look to Matthew 6 for a moment. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 to 36. Our Lord Jesus Christ said this. He said, For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink, nor for your body is what you're going to put on. Is not life more than food and body more than clothing? And I don't know about you, but you know, you may be having those thoughts. You're wrestling, well, how am I going to pay the bills this month? How am I going to make ends meet? How am I going to do this? How am I going to survive? My friends, you cannot starve a man who's feeding on God's promises. Joseph and Mary had no idea what was going to happen. But the gifts that God provided when these wise men came to visit, unexpectedly, out of the blue, was going to provide for their needs down in Egypt, for a place to stay and food, all the stuff they're going to need. And God will provide for your needs. Let's continue in Matthew 6. Jesus said, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow, nor they reap, nor they gather in the barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And are you not worth much more than they? You probably have a bird feed at your house. We have one at our house. And the birds, when the snow came, boy, I tell you, my bird feed was very, very, very busy. My dog loved it. Oh, look at all the birds. My dog's been an avid bird watcher. It's a bird dog, but that's another story. It's a blessing to be used to meet the needs of others, even the animal kingdom. And God will meet your needs. He said, consider the birds of the air. And, and who you can worry and can be at a single hour to your life. You're wondering how this is going to happen, what's going to happen, how you're going to get by. My friend, it will not add to your life. Worry will not help you at all. In fact, it will shorten your lifespan. It's been proven to the stress on the body. And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say that not even Solomon in his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown in the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what are we going to eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. God knows that you need these things. He knows your needs. But he says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Amen? Don't worry about it. Folks, don't stress it. God will provide your needs. You cannot starve a man. You cannot starve a person who's feeding on God's promises. And the story of the gifts that the wise men brought, unexpected, God will meet every need. Avoidance. Number five, avoidance. Having been warned by God in a dream not to return to the Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Just like the story of Balaam, in Numbers chapter 22 to 24, the Most High God monitors the affairs and activities of non-believers. Even such weasels like King Herod, and no offense to weasels, God knows what's going on. He monitors what's going on in Washington, D.C. He knows what's going on in Sacramento. He knows what's going on in Reading, at the Board of Supervisors. And folks, He knows what's going on in your life. God knows. He monitors the affairs and activities of non-believers. And just like he communicated with Balaam, God can communicate with non-believers like these magi in whatever way necessary to accomplish his one purposes. He spoke to him in a dream, so go another way. It says, being warned by dream, they didn't delay. The magi didn't consider their options. They left by night, no goodbyes, no souvenir shopping since they're in Jerusalem. They just went on the way, a separate way, and they just left left town. And they dropped off the pages of Scripture. But they were used by God to accomplish His purposes. 
What a contrasting picture in our story here. He had Gentiles, non-believers, non non-Jewish people who sought him, who was born a king. They sought him out traveling a long distance. You had a fake king, Herod, who opposed the true king and was trying his best way he could stop it up. But my friends, you can't undo the will of God. God's will will be accomplished in heaven and on the earth. Finally, you had the religious folks, the religious experts, totally ignoring the king that was in their midst. Simply amazing. And people respond to Jesus the same way today, do they not? Some seek him. Some reject and oppose him. And others ignore him. And that's the story and the message of the Magi. Which one are you? What is your response to Jesus this Christmas? The Bible tells us in John chapter 1, verses 10 to 13, He said, It came unto his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as did receive him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but born of God. Christmas time is often associated with giving of gifts, but Christmas is truly about the greatest gift of all, God's gift to us of His Son, Jesus. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. In John 3, 16, we know that verse, For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. And Romans 6, 23, which says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Hope you're here this morning or you're listening to this message. You've, you've accepted and received God's gift of salvation. You've given, you received His gift of eternal life through forgiveness of sins by trusting in Jesus Christ as your Savior. But it still leaves us where we are. Some people will reject Him. Some people will ignore Him. But wise men still seek Him. Which category do you fall into this Christmas? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. We thank you for this season set apart to celebrate the coming of Jesus Christ the earth. And the story doesn't end there with a Christmas story. The story continues that he lived a sinless life, did many marvelous things, and spoke much, much truth. And he went to the cross and died for our sins and was buried and rose again the third day, a bodily resurrection. And Jesus has ascended to heaven, and, and he's coming back to establish his kingdom, a kingdom which will never end, for he was born to be a ruler. Father, thank you for this time. We thank you for the Christmas story, and we thank you for this passage of your word. May we be seeking him who was born King of the Jews, even this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us stand and we'll close with a song.